Hi there, this is Chris Walter, pastor at Oakdale and New Beginnings Churches. This is our weekly sermon message. Thank you for joining us today, and I hope that this message inspires you to grow in your faith and helps you to see God in your life. Enjoy the message. Well, greetings, brothers and sisters. Thank you again for inviting me into your home today as we worship our God, as we hear today again in this continued journey from the book of Revelation. Friends, before we get into the text today, I just want to take a moment and pray and, and also just share some things with you. As we know, the, uh, the pandemic is still in full force. We, we see uh, some counties where there are more cases being reported and others declining. Yet in all of it, we are reminded that in the midst of this time we are in, we must not only remain flexible, but yet diligent in our walk of faith. Because in that walk of faith, my friends, we are not just responsible for us, but we're responsible for the body of Christ and the community at whole. And I want to encourage you as you go forth into this time and this, this, this moment of history we are in, that you are mindful of that. I, I understand there are a lot of inconveniences. There are a lot of things that are going on where we don't know answers to just yet. But let us be patient. Let us have faith. And most importantly, let us lean into our Lord. Uh, friends, you know, here not only in Northwest Ohio, but throughout the state, there are, there are more and more cases showing up. And so as a result, some areas are having to uh, pause in-person worship services. And, and should we need to do that, I'll, I'll, of course, be informing you. Yet we have this great medium, this great technology that allows us to still gather together, whether in person or online. Yet that doesn't preclude us from continuing to be in prayer. Prayer for the miracle that this pandemic will come to an end. Praying for a miracle that those we love and care for in the world will remain safe, both from this virus, but also just from evil and brokenness in the world. Now, friends, you know, the pandemic is in full force, but yet we cannot forget that there is still evil in the world. There's still brokenness, families being broken apart, uh, individuals losing their jobs, folks fighting addictions, folks uh, basically being abandoned by their loved ones, children struggling to figure out what it means to be themselves in this world, especially during this time. Today, friends, this is uh, as we close out July. I mean, you think about it. We're, we're seven full months now into this 2020 year, and we're about to enter August when a lot of our children and families are preparing for the start of school. This year, though, extraordinarily different. Some schools being completely online for the first uh, semester or first quarter. Other schools still debating, do we be hybrid? Do we have in person? What do we do? Other schools say, no, we're going to be in person. Our children are going to wear masks. We're going to set up protection for them. All of this changing. And then our children who, who are athletic or who do the arts are, are struggling because those things are being postponed or even worse, canceled. We have other young men and women going off to college for the very first time this next month. For some, they're headed there regardless. Others are being postponed or delayed. It's impacting our world in a dramatic way still today. None of it has changed. And so we must remain diligent in our prayer lives. And so friends, today as we, as we come into prayer, I wanna, wanna pray for, for this pandemic and that it does uh, end and that God's hand of miracle is upon it. But also in the meantime, that those who are impacted by it, those who are struggling with it, those who are facing just an uncertainty that creates anxiety, they themselves are being surrounded by God's love and grace today. They feel his presence. And finally, I'm reminded as, as we go through the book of Revelation, which is a book that John writes to give a foundation and remind the churches of the power of Jesus Christ, there are some out there who still don't know Jesus. And it's your job. It is my job. It is all of our jobs as followers of Christ to share that gospel with them. John clearly indicates that, friends. And so my hope is that through through this year, through this calendar year, which seems to be, for some say, I cannot wait till 2021. Well, be careful what you wish for, because what if next year's worse? My prayer is that it's better. My prayer is that we see God's glory in a magnificent way. But yet until then, 
Until then, let us be diligent in our prayer life, my friend. And so, brothers and sisters, as we enter into the eighth month of this year, the month of August, there are a lot we can be praying for. There are those even in our community who are struggling with health issues. There are some who, who have lost a lot this year. Right? They, they, they've had folks leave their earthly realm and head into God's glory, and we celebrate that. We praise God for that, but those behind still have a hole in their heart, and God's filling it, and many of them I know personally. Maybe you're watching this tonight, and you're one of those who just says, Pastor, I just feel an emptiness in me that I've never felt before because my loved one is not here with me to walk in this life. And so my prayer today is for you as well. And so it's in that word, my friends, it's in that moment where we acknowledge the love of Christ, but also we, as the body of Christ, pray for each other. And so the Lord be with you, my friends. Gracious and loving God, today on this ground, in this holy, holy place, here in Northwest Ohio, in the little community of Deschler, we come to you, Lord, as the body of Christ, a magnificent and powerful body of Christ, a, a body of Christ which is large, which is significant, we arrive, Lord, to, to give thanks and praise to you. We ask, Lord, that on this day, whether we are in person or online, we ask for your grace and mercy to be upon us. We ask, Lord, for protection during this pandemic, both for ourselves, but also for our neighbors, for those who are still working in the hospitals, for those still who are fighting this illness. Today, Lord, there are many, many in our, in our nation, in our state, and even in our own community, Lord, who fight this illness. We ask, Lord, that your hand of healing power be upon them. I ask, Lord, that as we enter the month of August, that you be with the families who have children preparing to go to school, whether it's first grade, kindergarten, whether it's 12th grade, whether it's off to college. You are with them, surrounding them, giving them peace upon their hearts because, Lord, I know they have to have great anxiety. What do we do? Is the question I hear most often, Lord, and I know you hear it every day, way more than I do. How will we live in this new pandemic era? And I know, Lord, you are trying to teach us, trying to show us a way back into your word, because that is how we, Lord, can live in this life. And I just ask for your guidance today. Finally, Lord, I ask for healing to be with my friends, to be with my families, to be with those that you have brought not just into my life, but into this community that you, that you call yours. There are many, Lord, who are hurting physically. Some are facing surgeries in these days, weeks ahead. Some have just come out of surgeries, Lord, and they're recovering. And I ask, Lord, that your hand of mercy be upon them. Some, Lord, are, are struggling with their own personal health. They're trying to figure out what's going on with their physical bodies. Yet, Lord, empower and strengthen their mental, their mental and their spiritual lives. But at the same time, healing of physical bodies. Be with those, Lord, who still don't know. Empower us, Lord, as the body of Christ, as your beloved children, to speak into their lives today. That we may, as the body of Christ, enter into their life. And show them the hope, the light, the light that is in your Son, Jesus Christ. Even, Lord, we ourselves are sinners. Even though, Lord, we are struggling ourselves. Let us be an example of hope into the world. And so, Lord, we give thanks for all of these things and many, many others. But Lord, I know, I feel it, that your spirit is at work in me. And I give thanks and great praise to that, Lord, for I see your hand upon the world. You are eliminating injustices. You are setting free those who are enslaved, and you are healing the sick. So Lord, I give thanks for this gift. I give thanks in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, through the power of the great Holy Spirit, all honor is yours, Lord, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Well, my friends, today as we continue this journey uh, through the book of Revelation, it's a challenging book, yes, I think you'll agree with that, but yet I think, I hope, by this point of our journey, you'll recognize the power that is in this book, this last book of Scripture that John writes to the people of the churches of Asia Minor. Yet he writes it to you and I to give us a, a sense and a power of what it means to have Jesus Christ in our lives. It means that all the pain and struggle, all the fear and anxiety that we hold on to, we have a way to let it go. We have a way to let it be released 
It doesn't mean that some won't stick with us. It doesn't mean that some won't come back because we live in an evil, broken world. But yet we have a hope that others who don't follow Christ, and that is that because we believe, we have a place with eternity with him. And that we, we have been forgiven. And today, friends, we're going to jump ahead again. Last Sunday, I, I, I shared with you, we, we took a little leap from chapter 6 uh, into chapter 12, 13, and 14, in which we heard from John. And today, we're going to take another little leap into chapter 19. Now, now something I want to point out as we do these things, um, it doesn't mean that the passages between what we read last week and what we'll read today are insignificant. No, by any means, they're just as significant. Yet today's message and next Sunday's message uh, for me, ties it all together. It brings it to, to a conclusion, at least for us, because I could preach on this book for, for a year if I wanted to, um, but God's laying some other things on my heart to share with you. And so, so, so today and then next Sunday, we're going to close out uh, this book of Revelation. And so we're going to pick up in, in chapter 19. J- just a reminder, as you re- remember, uh, we started in this book, and as we began, we heard from John in which John mentions to us that that there is a vision that he has received from Jesus Christ. John, as a disciple, John, who was there with all of this, receives this vision, a revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave to him, and then is confirmed by angels. And so we have a powerful, powerful vision. And John then begins to describe many things. Remember, I mentioned last Sunday, I talked a little bit about how we look at this book through different lenses, whether it's the lens of God speaking to us today where we're at right now, or as a, as a, I'll call it a, a code in which we can see the future possibilities of God's work in the world. Yet the struggle is we have to decipher all that, don't we? And so that prophecy that John is describing, for some, is hard to hear, see, and understand. But yet, we don't have to live there, do we? Uh, we can live in that lens, we can read the scripture that way, or we can lead it in the sense of, this is God giving me a lens into the world. Powerful, powerful message. Jesus uh, reminds us as he spoke to John, he said that I, I am the one who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Right? Jesus was there in the beginning, Jesus is here today, and Jesus will be there in the future. In other words, God is never going to abandon you. God will never leave you, even when it's hard to see God there. And John will say this passage over and over again, referring back to, to the book of Genesis, referring back to the gospel of John, right? Jesus there in the beginning. Uh, And and we talk about a sword, which is in Jesus's mouth. The word of God is a powerful word. It is what cuts through all that brokenness, that, that I think misunderstanding of our own faith. It's there, it is there. He then will talk to the churches, giving them uh, what I would say is, is encouragement in, in the face of a troubled times. But also John will proclaim that even in that, as you have done great things, there is still work. There is still work to be done. And for you, I know that the same is true. You are a strong follower of Christ because you have him in your heart. But there's still work to be done. And maybe you're watching this and you're being like, Pastor, I don't have Jesus in my heart yet. Well, I want you to know all you gotta do is ask him in and he'll come in and your life will be changed. But it doesn't mean the work is over means the work is just beginning. And we're here to help as the body of Christ because guess what? We're all in a work in progress. We're all in our masterpiece being carved out by the good Lord each and every day. And know that we're here to walk alongside you. And so after all this, we, 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 we spent some time last Sunday talking about these two beasts that exist, the, the, the beast of economic power and the beast of authoritative power of Rome. But it, it, that exists even today, doesn't it? Well, we have those powers uh, of those things, material things that are in our lives that, that are important, but yet have a, have a hand over us. And we begin to elevate them. We begin to raise them up so they're equal to Christ. And there are other things in our life. There, there are the external powers which oversee us, which I think in a sense can hold us back from that vision God calls us to live. Financial governmental, all of these things, but yet we cannot live to those above Christ because Christ is first and foremost. The elders that John talks about as things that we touch on. And so as we as we continue in this journey, we're going to pick up again, as I mentioned a moment ago, chapter 19. And here John um, 
Well, well, let me put it this way. There are three parts to the Gospel of John. The first part is what I mentioned, chapters 1 through 3, in which John begins to establish his vision for the churches of Asia Minor. Uh, picking up in chapter 4, going all the way through to the end of chapter 19, John is laying out this cosmic battle between good and evil. I mean, that's really what he's doing at the end of the day. He's also talking about the heavenly throne of Jesus Christ and how that heavenly throne in the cosmic war between good and evil, that will and always does win the day. Evil contemporarily, when we can temporarily give in to that, but yet it is through the throne of Christ, that throne and his army, which overpowers evil all the time and will win. And good always conquers evil, as John will point out. But yet as followers of Christ, we, we have a choice. Do we want to be a part of that heavenly army or do we want to be a part of the group that gets crushed, is filled with stress no matter what happens, and we end up losing ourselves to the world? That's John's point. And so we pick up in chapter 19 today. Um, th this is... Um, as it closes out this section, and oh, by the way, the last section starting in chapter 20 through the end of the book, we'll talk about heaven as this new city. Um, there's passages in there that we use even in, 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 in funerals. Why? Because it is, it is a powerful image of the new heaven coming onto earth when God is completely victory over evil, when evil is completely gone and, and Jesus returns onto earth. We're going to get to that next Sunday. But for today, we're talking about uh, John's imagery of the presence of God in our lives, even as we struggle to see God in the world today. We live in this pandemic era, don't we? Uh, it's a new era, and it's hard sometimes to see Christ in the, in the midst of it all. Uh, I, I talked to many, many uh, parents who have kids going to school, uh, whether it's Patrick Henry, Macomb, uh, whether it's in Bowling Green or Perrysburg or or Eastwood, or Elmwood, or it, you name the school district. I've talked to parents through, through the various connections I have, and they all come down to the same point. We'd really love to just have an answer so that we can go back to normalcy, back to the way it was, because I don't want my child who is going into school to have an experience like they did at the end of the year. And the reality is it's, it's going to be different no matter what happens, but we can't lose that hope, can we? That in that newness, Something magical, something powerful will occur because God will have his hand upon it. And so we have to be hopeful because our kids need to hear that. And I message that to folks many times. And so John in this chapter, chapter 19, he will, he will write. Um, we're going to read verses 1 through uh, 10 today. And, and partly because there's a couple things that I, wanna, I want you to listen for. First is, is you're going to hear two hymns. Uh, two hymns in this in this beginning part. It's John's celebration of the new heaven, um, of what heaven can be and represent for us, and that is hope in the world. And so I want to share this with you now, starting in chapter 19, verse 1. Hear these words. After this, I heard what seemed to be a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven saying, Hallelujah, salvation and glory and power to our God, for his judgments are true and just. He has judged the great whore who corrupted the earth with her fornication. He has avenged on her the blood of his servants. Once more they said, Hallelujah. The smoke goes up from her forever and ever. And the 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshiped God who was seated on the throne saying, Amen, Hallelujah. And from the throne came a voice saying, Praise our God, all you servants and all you who fear him, small and great. Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude like the sound of many waters and like the sound of many thunder peals crying out hallelujah for the lord our god the almighty reigns let us rejoice and exalt and give him the glory for the marriage of the lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready to her has been granted to be clothed with fine linen bright and pure for the fine linen is the righteousness deeds of the saints and the angel said to me write this Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, These are the true words of God. And then I fell down at his feet and worshipped him. But he said to me, You must not do that. I am a fellow servant with you and your comrades who hold the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. 
And so this passage out of the Gospel of John, or not the Gospel of John, sorry, I was thinking of last Sunday's sermon, out of Revelation uh, from John. Um, let, let me ask you this question. Let me let you ponder this as we go through this. Have you ever found yourself at a point in life when you just wonder, where is God at in this moment? Where is God at right now? How can, how can God allow this to happen? It's the old question, why does God allow pain and suffering? If God is so amazing, why can't God just wipe it out? Uh, many times in history, we, we've experienced this. World War I, World War II, all, all the wars for, for that matter. Um, tragedies in history. We can ask, I'm sure folks who were on the Titanic when that sunk asked, where is God now? Why isn't God here to save us as this ship sinks in the middle of the Atlantic in the frigid waters when no one is around? I mean, I'm sure many thought the same thing as they boarded planes on the morning of September 11th. Everything was great and wonderful. And as they took off and as they flew, they realized very quickly that evil had found found a way to create chaos and pain. And in that moment, the world was never the same, was it? And people asked even then, where was God? Where is God right now? Well, there are times even in our own personal lives when cancer shows up. The death of a loved one happens suddenly and quickly. Or even it is a long, drawn-out process. And we say, where is God today? Children become sick with diseases like cancer or other ailments, and we wonder, where is God in the midst of this? Why is God allowing my child to be ill? Why isn't God showing up to protect, to heal? They say he's the great physician. These are all powerful and valued questions. But John will celebrate all of this, though, because he says, hallelujah, amen, praise our God. Small and great. He acknowledges that God reigns, reigns forever. The hymns that we hear here, uh, there are two of them. The first one begins in verse 3. The second one begins in verse 6. But both of these hymns are praises to God in the midst of everything that's going on. Think about this period of time. The, the churches of Asia Minor are, are still struggling as John writes this letter. Remember, nothing's changed just yet. John's still writing the letter, sending it off to the seven churches. They're under the rule of Rome. They, had, they were on the outskirts, okay? They were on the outskirts of, of the world at that time, of the known world. And, and because they were on the outskirts, they, they didn't have a lot of worry about Rome initially. But once Rome takes over, those pagan rituals come in and, and people begin to have to worship Rome. They have to look to the emperor and say, that is God. That is God. Caesar is God. Well, for those Christians in these churches of Asia Minor, they're like, but that's not God. That's, that's not Jesus. And they're conflicted. But they know if they don't acknowledge him as Caesar, if they don't go to the celebrations and the festivals that are put on by the Roman Empire in their new communities, they face prison. They face, most importantly, death. And do they want to give their life and, and, they, and they have to have their families watch them be torn apart, whether by lions or on the cross? And all they got to do is say, you're right, Caesar is God. Or do they hold true to their faith? When Jesus Christ is their Lord and Savior and the Father in heaven who sent Jesus Christ is God. Have you ever struggled with that for yourself? Wondering where is God in the midst of everything that I'm going through? I mean, here we have this, this prominent message from, from John praising God in the midst of all this. And, and I think for us, when we have pain and suffering, it's so hard to look to the heavens and acknowledge God's presence. It is so difficult to wake up every morning, see the sunrise, and think to ourselves, amen, hallelujah. Let me dance for the Lord because that sunrise is for me. Or, or in the evening after a long, hard day of stressful work and anxiety filled, to put that aside and praise God for the masterpiece that he's painting in the sky. Or, or go outside in the middle of the night and look to the heavens and see the multitude of stars. and Praise God. Praise God when we're in the hospital visiting someone who's sick and saying, 
praise God that he is here in this space. It is so difficult, isn't it? I know. I've had hard times watching a loved one pass away, thinking to myself, oh, how can I dance? How can I sing hallelujah right now? And I have to be reminded from time to time, just as you do, I'm no different, that in that death, there is glory. Because they are here. They're not with me anymore. I don't get to ask them questions. Have them tell me stories of their past. Have lunch. Whatever it might be. I, get, I don't get to watch them grow up. You know, many times I've done funerals for, for children, whether they were uh, in their teens or, or early 20s. And I think to myself, this is so sad. This is such a heartbreak because they don't get to experience life. We don't get to, as the outsiders, get to watch them blossom and see where they go in life. This is the end for them. And a lot of those funerals are tragedies, uh, car accidents. And, and those events, my friends, makes you wonder. But for me, it is about singing hallelujah. For me, it is about praising God in that moment, just as John does here. So let's look at this passage a little bit, if we would. So after this, I heard what seemed to be a loud voice of great multitude in heaven. So John is hearing another voice, this time of angels in heaven. Now, some of it you need to go back and read chapter 18, but here John, as he, as he goes from a, from a place of struggle, he hears angels singing. And they're saying, hallelujah. They're saying, amen. They're saying, hallelujah being translated just really is, hallelujah is praise God in this moment. Salvation and glory and power to our God, for his judgments are true and just. Now it changes, right? He gives a little bit of kind of a abrupt, a little rough description. He says, he has judged the great whore who corrupted the earth with her fornication. He has avenged on her the blood of his servants. He has used Jesus through his blood to forgive and to restore those who walked away or using to describe in this case, in this particular instance, someone who has evil intent, someone who, who desires to cause chaos and in so corrupted the earth with sin. This is another description of evil John is referring to, not of an individual person. But God has stepped in and avenged evil, brokenness, emptiness with the blood of Christ. And in that, through not just Jesus, but those who follow Christ, they sing hallelujah, praise be to God. The smoke goes up from her forever and ever. This smoke is a smoke of praise. Her death, not in vain, but her death, recognizing God was there in the midst of it. God was there in the midst of it. And I know it's hard to see God in the midst of what you're going through today. And it's hard to praise God and sing hallelujah, but God is calling you to do this today, my friends. And again, here we go. Verse four, this sounds familiar, doesn't it? It's again a theme John uses throughout. And the 24 elders and the four living creatures fall down and worship God. Another acknowledgement that Jesus Christ is above all of that. Those things we lose that we don't want to lose that we want to hold on to, and nowhere, nowhere equal to Jesus. For he is seated on the throne. And Jesus acknowledges, hallelujah, hallelujah, for the people have followed me. And another, another instance here, verse 5, from the throne a voice comes saying, praise our God and all his servants. In all who fear him, small and great. Again, remember, the word fear is not about being afraid, but it's about being in awe of God, being in awe of what God does, even in the midst of the pain and the suffering we're seeing in the world. Today, God is still at work. How many instances have we seen? And, and you know, bless our media. God, oh, I tell you, just bless their hearts. They, they want to show us evil because that sells, right? Car accidents sell. We, we want to see what's going on. It just draws our attention like a flock to a main. 
But yet when we see something hopeful, oh, it just warms our heart, doesn't it? In the midst of all the injustice and, and rioting and, and chaos that's going on in our nation, there are moments when we see individuals coming together. We've seen police officers stop and play basketball with young, young men and women. Right? Why? Because they want to praise God in the midst of that, don't they? And there is God working. We, we see, we, I remember a video when this all started where a young man, African-American, decided that he was going to go and help those law officers, stand with them, brought him water, told them, keep doing the work you're doing. Keep doing what you're doing. Hmm. As the second hymn begins, it, it, it's about, the, the second hymn is, is a call to worship for the church, the church on earth, that, the church universal. It is in that where he says, and, there, and I heard a voice, what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude again, the angels, like a sound of many waters, like the sound of mighty thunder peals crying out, hallelujah, for the Lord our God almighty reigns. God reigns in it all, doesn't he? God, we praise God in all. And he says, let us rejoice and exalt and give him the glory. And then he describes a wedding scene. For the marriage of the lamb, that's Jesus, has come. And his bride, Israel, has made herself ready. To her, it has been granted to be clothed with fine linen, bright and pure. For the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. How are you clothed in the midst of your pain and struggle? Are you feeling, are you acknowledging that you are loved and praised? That through the blood of Christ, you have been restored? Even when you can't feel the presence of God in the midst, God is at work. Do you feel that? And he says it here. And finally, he closes out by saying, And the angel said to me, Write this down. Again, John's vision being directed to write this down. Blessed are those who invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb, the, the marriage between Christ and you, when you accept Jesus in your heart, that bonding together which cannot ever be unbroken. These are the true words of God. And John falls down to worship him. But he again is told. Remember early on when he fell down at Jesus' feet and Jesus places his hand on his shoulder and says, Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. Rise. Stand strong. For he did that. And he said, You cannot do that. The voice says, I am a fellow servant with you and your counter. In other words, acknowledging God and Jesus walks with us in this broken world. We don't do it alone. We don't journey this life alone, for Christ is here today with all of us. Hmm. Worship God. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. In other words, the spirit of Jesus, as we share the gospel message, this is what he says at the conclusion of this, that that message will transform us, that message will rise us out of despair and give us hope again. Even if our circumstances have changed drastically from what it was six months ago, if we hold on to the hope that is in Christ, if we hold on to the love that is found in him, and if we hold on to the forgiveness that he gives to us, my friends, we are transformed because we begin to become the light on the hill that John refers to hidden in these messages. In other words, do you acknowledge the love of Christ? in every day, in every situation. It's this rejoicing in heaven, this voice that he refers to, these visible signs over and over again through this chapter. It, it will go on as he concludes and, and includes, encourage you to read the rest of chapter 9, 19. Um, but he says in verse 17, it says, I saw an angel standing in the sun and with a loud voice he called to all the birds that fly in midheaven, come gather for the great supper of God to eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of the mighty, the flesh of horses and the riders, flesh of all, both free and slaves, small and great. This is an image of, of the spirit of God surrounding and enveloping you today, enveloping the whole world so that we all will know the love of Christ. Hmm. Talks about the beasts who will eventually fight this great army and they will lose. Why? Because the sword the writer, which is Jesus Christ, the sword of God's word will strike them down. Hmm. 
the Holy Spirit is and will surround you today, my friends. And so my question to you is this as we leave this passage. Do you recognize that God is with you everywhere you go? That he walks with you in this world? And that sometimes, as that, as that poem says with footprints, that sometimes there's only one set because Jesus had to carry you? Do you truly recognize that? Do you truly recognize that as you journey in this life, there are moments in time when you feel apart from Christ, but yet do you recognize that God was still there? Look back at those times. Take some time, even right now and today in this pandemic we're in, look at where is God showing up in your life. And I promise you, he is absolutely 100% there. Because as we hear from John in this chapter, even as he falls down, Jesus says, I am with you. I am with you. I am with all who hold me in their hearts. You shall never be abandoned. And so my friends, look at this week. Look at your past to see where God is at. Look at where God is with you right now. Encouraging you in walk of faith. Challenging you as you go forth in this world. Feel the love of Christ and sing to the world. And so my friends, as you go forth now, May you go forth with the love of Christ in your heart. May you go forth knowing how much you are loved. Lord, I come, I confess. Bowing here, I find my rest, and without you, I fall apart, and you're the one that guides my heart.
So, brothers and sisters, may the days ahead be blessed for you. May you feel the love of Christ everywhere you go. May you see Christ everywhere you turn. May you share that good news with the world. I give thanks and praise for you, my friends, because I know Jesus is walking with you. God bless, and I look forward to joining you again next week as we close out this book of Revelation. Amen.